My name is Seth Bromberger. Um, I'm a, a security researcher. I work at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, I'm focused on critical infrastructure protection, uh, and I'm uh, using a combination of uh, graph analytics and machine learning to solve some uh, pretty sticky cybersecurity problems. Uh, I tell you this by way of background because um, I am uh, definitively not a mathematician. So any questions that you have following this presentation that have anything to do with math or numbers, I'm going to defer to my colleague James. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce James. <laughs> uh, uh, James Fairbanks is a research engineer uh, focusing on online media and also cybersecurity. Uh, he's also looking at ways to combine graph analytics and machine learning uh, to solve cybersecurity problems at GTRI. Um, and he, uh, he was a user of light graphs before he became one of the core contributors. Um, and, um, the main difference here is that uh, James is a mathematician. So again, all the hard questions go to him. Uh, first off, why do we care about graphs? Um, you know, why does a cybersecurity guy care about graphs? Well, you know, everywhere you look in computer science, you have things that can be represented by graphs. So you've got syntax trees, Markov chains, a whole bunch of other things that can be represented in graph format, where a graph is a collection of vertices uh, that are connected sometimes and sometimes not connected by a collection of edges. Um, graphs are everywhere. Uh, they're everywhere, not only in computer science, but outside and I challenge you uh, when you leave today to look around you uh, as you wander through the campus and think of things that might be graph representable. Um, we focused uh, primarily on the analysis of graphs. Uh, so how do we look at uh, specific domain problems uh, with, with graph layout? Um, and can we use metrics about the graph structures that we create to describe the environments in our domain? Um, can we use those metrics to maybe inform uh, other activity? And this is especially important in cybersecurity. So uh, I want to take you back to late 2014, early 2015. Uh, I, was, uh, I was a consultant back then. This was before I joined the lab. Uh, and I was working with a client who had a bunch of activity logs, uh, some of which uh, were suspicious. Um, and we wanted to find out whether we could trace back the, uh, the infection of a couple of machines to some common source. Well, that sort of screamed out, well, maybe we can use a graph for this. And I had just started using Julia. Uh, and I I came from Python, uh, and I wanted to do everything in Julia because I figured it was going to be a great language, and, and I wanted to learn it as quickly as possible, and, you know, hey, this client was paying me to do it, so why not? Uh, so I did a search, graphs Julia, and found graphs.jl. This looks awesome. It looks exactly like what I want to use, so let's go ahead and try it. Uh, I quickly found out that graphs.jl was less of a graph analytic library and more of a graph factory. That is, you could produce any type of graph with any internal representation you wanted. Uh, but there were no performance guarantees, and you had to write a whole bunch of code yourself. And as I said, I was sort of on the clock with this client. So it was really tough for me to justify using a package and developing a whole bunch of methods for this package that would be performance uh, in my use case. Um, and having to learn the intricacies of this package uh, to begin with. So graphs.jl is, is still out there. It's still a great package if you want to experiment with different representations, internal representations of graph structures. Um, but I needed something different. Uh, and so uh, with heavy heart, I went back to uh, Python and my tried and true Network X. The issue with Network X, uh, well, the advantage of Network X uh, as opposed to some of the other Python graph libraries, is that uh, it's very simple to use and it's a one language uh, solution. So that is, it's in, written entirely in Python. There are no C calls or anything like that, no C libraries needed. Um, there are lots of features. I mean, anything you want to do with graphs, it's, it's in Network X. It's sort of the reference implementation for a lot of these analytics. Uh, the problem is internally it was storing uh, the graphs as dictionaries of dictionaries, and Python is just really, really slow when it comes to complex calculations on dictionaries of dictionaries. Uh, so. Uh, with, with a little more joy in my heart, I switched back to Julia and decided to roll my own. Uh, it was originally called Fast Graphs, and I was, uh, when I went to register it, uh, Tony Kelman uh, tactfully pointed out that uh, the folks who made graphs.jl might take offense if we called it fastgraphs.jl because it implies that graphs is slow. So we renamed it to Light Graphs, 
um, because it's one implementation, it's a single implementation, a single representation of graph structure. Um, and we had three design goals. Uh, I had three design goals when I started. First off, I wanted it to be simple. I wanted someone who was not a graph analyst uh, to be able to come in, pick up this package, and use it for whatever whatever job they had in whatever domain they were studying. Uh, so if you're, if you're a biologist and you needed a graph representation, you should be able to take light graphs and just use it. Um, if you're a mathematician, you should just be able to use it. Uh, if you're a chemist, same thing. Uh, if you're an economist, same thing. So I wanted something that was very simple. I also wanted something that was fast. I didn't want to go down the network X rabbit hole and um, have something that was, you know, that looked good and was complete, but it wouldn't work on, uh, at the time, what I considered large graphs. And now that I'm at the lab and having talked to a bunch of other folks, um, they were actually small graphs. Um, but uh, I wanted something that would work on the graphs that I was dealing with, which were a few hundred thousand to a few million nodes. Um, and I wanted a consistent interface. A lot of the things that I saw out there in the Python world, you'd, you'd run similar types of operations, but you'd get back different data structures. And it was really difficult to tell what you should do with the return value. So if we're doing a centrality measure, for example, I w across the entire graph, I want a vector of floats representing that centrality. And so I wanted something that, that was consistent, not just externally, but internally as well. So I wanted the developers or hopeful developers uh, of light graphs to be able to see an interface, a development interface that made sense to them. In graphs, I quickly learned that everything's a trade-off. Uh, th this is particularly important in terms of internal representation of graphs. Uh, whether you use adjacency lists, which is what we do in light graphs, versus sparse matrices, which is uh, what we're starting to do with a different thing, uh, versus dense matrices, which don't scale at all, versus, and you have a whole bunch of other ways to represent these graphs. Um, vertex and edge metadata, this was a fairly, uh, important decision that we made. It's, it was less controversial, actually, than, than I thought it would be. But essentially, we store graph structure and the interrelationships between the vertices. We don't store anything else in light graphs. So if you need the color of a vertex or the weight of an edge, uh, we don't store that. You have to store that externally. And that, that actually turned out pretty, pretty well because what it means is you can have very complex data structures uh, associated with vertices and edges that can be accessed very quickly in other optimized data stores. We didn't want to be a general database. We wanted to be a graph analytics package. Uh, vertex indexing is another one. We use vertices from 1 to n. Uh, there are no exceptions. You can't have gaps. It's just you've got 10 vertices. Your, verte your vertices are numbered 1 through 10. Uh, there's nothing else you can do. Um, and then edge sets and edge iterators. I'll go into a little bit of a deep dive on edge sets in a couple of slides. Um, We've changed direction a couple of times, um, most importantly around how we internally represent data inside the graph structure. Uh, right now we're using sorted adjacency lists. We used to use edge sets uh, to, uh, in addition to unsorted adjacency lists. And that gave you really, really fast random edge lookup using the set, um, but it came at a very big cost. Um, it came at a cost of, of having the set. Again, this will be on the next slide. So. Um, it, it increases our cost for graph creation and, and edge insertion, but you usually only do this once. Um, uh, but given that we're sorting the adjacency list now, we've got a, a log n or a log degree lookup um, on uh, random edge accesses. Uh, the second major direction change that we made was around parameterization. Graphs.jl was parameterized, you know, 20 different ways, and that caused complexity. And so my early days with Julia, I didn't like parameterization at all. I wanted to be specific. So like graphs version 7 and below, or 0 0.7 and below, uh, you used integers, and whatever your system defined as an int, that's what we used, and there was no deviation from that. Um, if you parameterize based on integer, though, 
Uh, you can get memory savings. So if you've got a small graph that doesn't require 2 to the 64 possible vertices, um, you might be able to use a uint 16 to represent that. And all of a sudden, you've got some tremendous, tremendous memory savings. You also have some speed ups as well as things can be optimized. Um, it gives us flexibility for new graph types because we might want to have vertices that are not sequentially numerically uh, indexed, or we might want to have edges with other metadata. Um, and so what this, what this did is it forced us to define a formal interface for Lightgrass, which we did in 0 0.8. Um, and this interface is basically a contract that if you, if you provide a consistent interface with these methods and these functions, uh, everything behind the scenes, all the centrality measures, all the analytics should just work. It's just if you define the functions and if you define them to be performant on your implementation of graphs, everything else will fall into place. And this is the beauty of Julia, that we can do something like this. So uh, really quickly on edge sets, um, as I mentioned before, we did have a set of edge that held all the edges, um, and it gave us O of one edge lookup, which is really nice. But we found that we didn't really use it that much. Um, and so we started thinking about, um, are there better ways, are there advantages uh, to dropping the edge set? Um, and the nice thing about Julia is we can e very easily profile code and we can see generally how much memory things are taking. And as a result, when we started studying the use cases and what people were using Lightgrass for and what we were using Lightgrass for, we found that if we got rid of the edge set and went to an O of log N edge lookup, we could save half the memory of a graph. Just just like that. And that was a compelling enough uh, memory savings for us to go ahead and pull, that, pull the trigger on that and make that switch. And so that's what we did. And uh, sometime in the 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, we got rid of edge sets. And nobody's really complained about that. So I think it was a good decision. Um, I'm going to turn it over to James, who's going to talk a little more about design uh, and some of the uh, performance benchmarks that we've recently run. So, so thanks, Seth, for that uh, introduction and uh, a little bit of history about the project. Am I close enough for the mic? Um, okay. So, uh, really, the part I'm going to talk about now is how we're using specific features uh, to Julia in order to do better on this graph analysis, graph data structure uh, workload that we care about. And we're all, as the Julia community here, working together to figure out what is idiomatic design. Um, how can we leverage multiple dispatch? How can we uh, leverage the type system, uh, in-place operations, the, some really nice conventions around like, um, you know, modifying operations. Uh, we want to take advantage of all these features and do better on uh, for our graph data structures based on that. So, and we're always guided by these three principles, simplicity, performance, and consistency. So one of the advantages that we've really reaped benefits from in terms of simplicity, uh, we made a decision, you know, this is going to be a one language solution. So this is the glorious promise of Julia, right? If everything is native Julia, then you get really great things. Um, I think Chris, uh, with the differential equations package, has shown great leverage of, you know, I get a ton of mileage out of being in one language and rather than linking against legacy codes. So then uh, we also con constricted ourselves to one data structure. Uh, at least in the beginning, this was definitely the right call because we were able to always reason about performance because we knew that the backing data structure was always going to be the same and this, these were its performance characteristics. So for a long time, that was really important. And then no metadata. Um, I've worked on some other uh, graph analysis packages, including something a C library called Stinger. And in that data structure, they store the metadata in the edges, which whenever you're comparing to somebody who doesn't store metadata like that, you're 4x slower just because of memory bandwidth. If you're, even if you're not using the weights or you're not using the metadata, you still have to pay costs. So we excluded metadata from this data structure and made it just really simple, right? It's a, it's a mutable type. There's a number of edges that we store that, so that's a constant time, and then the adjacency list. That's it. And that's just a vector of vectors. So uh, another area where we've reaped benefit from designing things well with Julia is performance. So one of the great things I like about 
writing structs in Julia is that I can look at the struct definition and know exactly how much memory I'm going to use. Um, so here we just have some formulas based on the definition for directed graphs and undirected graphs, how much memory they take. And one thing to point out, and we had a conversation earlier today at the conference, uh, there's this header. So we pay the size of the one int for the number of edges. The, and then for each vertex, we have a header for the neighbors of that vertex, and then the actual data. So kind of the minimum amount of data you could store is one, uh, one word per edge, right? Uh, and so we're paying for the, all these array headers. And that is really a case where we could um, use something like static arrays to shave off a bunch of memory um, at the cost of flexibility. So insertion performance would, would be worse, but uh, you'd store memory, you'd save memory. Um, and then we just compare here in these performance measures or performance benchmarks to some other uh, particularly Python accessible graph, tool, uh, graph libraries. Um, the benchmark the, uh, row index on this table is like, what we're computing. So the first two are just construction benchmarks. How quickly can we construct the graph? Either a uniform random graph, Erdos Rainey, or a Barabasi Albert kind of web, uh, you know, World Wide Web model. Um, and then, oh, the colors here, the silver is second place and gold is first place, kind of like Olympic medals. And you can see that uh, we're, al we're always in first and second place compared to these other uh, network X, which is pure Python, iGraph and GraphTool, which are both uh, C, C++ with Python wrappers. And the other things there are graph analysis measures. So we're really able to leverage a lot um, you know, because of all the hard work that's been put into the compiler and making sure everything in the standard library is fast, we get good, good performance on our graph analysis. So uh, we also really care a lot about consistency. And there's, consistency is an aesthetic judgment, so there's lots of ways to be consistent. And one way is to be consistent with the other Julia packages. So there's a, kind of an informal interface the start, next, done uh, iteration interface. And these informal interfaces, we try to respect them uh, as much as possible. Kind of, um, so here, we also really wanted to be consistent with how the code looks in a textbook. So you pull out your graph theory textbook, and there's some algorithm that uses graphs, and, and it shows you how to do it. I'd, it'd be really great if you could type that pseudocode into the Julia prompt and have an implementation. So we try as much as possible um, and also, we're consistent with the just write the loop um, behavior that a lot of packages or a lot of Julia programming goes down to. Instead of having these bulk operations that are optimized as much as possible, uh, we really care that when you just write the loop, you get good performance. Another way, uh, some some other aspect of consistency and, and using the Julia type system to help us out is if anybody is familiar with scientific computing. Uh, you're familiar with math errors. When you write your code, and your code runs, but it gives you the wrong numbers, right? Uh, this is very frustrating to me, and I think everyone else in scientific computing. And it'd be really great if instead of running and being wrong, my code would crash. This is a nice thing about memory errors, right? You get a seg fault, you know. <laughs> when, you, when you compute eigenvalues of a Laplacian and you get negative numbers, you don't know why, <laughs> right? Uh, so I decided to, uh, this was just purely out of frustration. I, I saw, I called eigs on, a, on what I thought was a Laplacian, and I got negative eigenvalues, and I was frustrated. And so out of frustration, I wrote, I'm never going to have this problem again. So I wrote graph matrices, which was a one file package, graphmatrices.jl. It's about two years ago, uh, where I encoded various aspects of these matrices into the type system. So then when you, so I made types for combinatorial adjacency and normalized adjacency and stochastic adjacency and averaging adjacency and then combinatorial Laplacian and normalized Laplacian and stochastic Laplacian and uh, averaging Laplacian. So then these matrices uh, allow you to do a compile time check of am I using the matrix I think I'm using, right? Because if I stick one of these matrices into a function that expects a different type and they're just sparse matrices, then It'll work, but I'll get the wrong numbers. So now uh, you get compiler or type errors that crash the code and let you know, here's a problem. 
Uh, so here we improve verification and validation of our codes. And I think this is something that the Julia community at large can leverage, where you trying to validate your scientific code, you can use the fact that the type system will check these things for you to make sure that you're not going to put, uh, you're not going to write code that's incorrect. And a little bit of work encoding this into the type system in the beginning reaps huge benefits later on. And um, another thing about this, so here's another area where we use multiple dispatch. So I wrote this whole thing for graph matrices based on matrices. So the backing data store was a sparse matrix. But then Seth had a great question, which is, what if I have a graph and I, wanna, I don't want to make a copy? I don't want to copy it into, an, an, into a matrix. I want to use the matrix directly, or use the graph that I've already got in memory. And so I was like, well, this seems like it should be easy. We just add some dispatch rules and then on some types, and then it'll be good. So the diff in order to actually allow this usage was four lines. It saves a factor of two in memory if you're doing any kind of spectral graph theory operations. You just shave a factor of two off your memory requirements right off the bat. And it was really taking constraints and making them go away, right? Um, so this is something that uh, we have an intuitive tension about. We like to you know, put type constraints on things because they give us correctness checks, but they often come back later and I just have to delete them in order to add more capabilities. Where if I would, had been more flexible, then uh, this would have worked with no changes to the code at all. So uh, here's another uh, something else we talked about. Really, over the last two years, we've gone from a very strict graph data structure and peeled off all of those constraints. And now we've uh, taken a look at abstraction again. This was in March. Uh, as we were preparing for compatibility with 0.6, we decided to make a huge code change to the internals, the same time as compatibility changes, um, which was not a great idea. <laughs> and, it, and it led to a pull request that touched 95% of the lines in the code base. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which, uh, so there's an issue on this package, which is never again <laughs> will we do these two things simultaneously. So it really opened up a lot of constraints, and, and this forced us to formalize an interface. You know, what is a graph data structure? It's something that can tell you the number of vertices, the number of edges, and given a vertex, who are its neighbors? And then some more technical uh, things that you have to implement as well. But not very much. There's about eight methods that you have to implement. And then you'll get all of the benefits of using our graph you know, connected components, um, minimum spanning tree, maximum flow, minimum cut. All of these things uh, just flow out from you introduced a new type of graph data structure. And because you've met the interface, uh, dispatch handles you know, all these other functions work for you. And the reason we really care about this now um, is we've started working on parallel algorithms. and when you're talking about parallel graph algorithms, you're going to have to make changes to your data structure because there's no one-size-fits-all graph data structure. Um, if you're talking about multi-threading, you're talking about multi-core or uh, multi-threading on multiple cores, you're talking about distributed memory on multiple processes, you need to lay out your graph differently in, in memory, or you're talking about out-of-core computation, so my edges are stored in a SQL database, or they're stored in uh, Julia DB, or they're determined automatically um, because they're computed from some uh, some other function that can give me access to edges on demand. All of those things uh, we're looking forward to supporting in the future now that we have done the heavy lifting of this abstract interface. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of packages I view as inspiration. Um, if anyone was at the differential equations talk uh, yesterday, that's, whew, and, but wait, there's more. Um, so differential equations and jump also, uh, where you have lots of different ways to do the same thing. And you need to choose an implementation that's right for your use case. Right? You need to choose the right solver for either differential equations or optimization. Uh, but you have the same problem. And we really uh, want to make graph algorithms fit that mold, where it's, this is the thing I want to compute on my graph, and this is an algorithm that I know will work and be performant on this type of graph, on this type of computational resource, uh, to decouple the implementation of the algorithms from the uh, definition of what you're trying to compute. And then, uh, based on some comments we got the other day, 
uh, there's a new pull request into light graphs for weighted graphs where you do store the edge weights uh, because that's always, we can all agree on how to store edge weights. It's sparse matrix, CSR type thing. Um, so that's the first test of this interface and we'd love to see more. Um, if you are working on a graph problem where your graph is large enough that you need to store it in an external database, uh, come talk to us and we'll, we'll see if we can make something happen there. Um, I'd love to see a SQL graph implementation where um, you're using a relational database to store your edges. We also have a, a GSOC student working with us, uh, Divyansh, Divyansh, Divyansh. Um, and he's working on parallel algorithms for graphs, particularly um, looking at the centrality measures and working in uh, the use case where you have uh, one graph that you can replicate among multiple processors. Um, and he's already having success and he's got a poster. So everyone should check out his poster. So in conclusion, uh, we think everyone who's doing graph, graph algorithms or graph work in Julia should at least take a look at light graphs. Um, it's a single language solution. It, we've got an active developer community and it's easy and fun to use. And all, as always, uh, we're focused on simplicity, performance, and consistency. Um, three values co-equal together. And uh, we'd like to thank all the contributors to Light Graphs, as well as the Julia community at large. Um, we couldn't do any of this without you, and we really appreciate it. So I'll take any questions. Yeah, so, uh, so the question is, uh, what's the status on visualization? And the story is not as great as it could be. Um, Seth, which, what's yeah. your official recommendation? So, uh, <laughs> we'll just stand up here. Uh, so we've got, we've got, so we've got Oh, you gotta use the mic. What? You gotta use the mic. Oh, man, okay. Uh, I'm looking at So we, we currently integrate with, with several visualization packages. Um, some of them are broken right now, uh, but we think that's uh, mainly a 0 0.6 issue. Um, but personally, um, we have, uh, I, I tend to favor GraphPlot, which is part of the Julia Graphs organization. Um, we're, we have a plot recipe for plots.jl um, as well. That, that's the one that's broken right now, and we're, we're desperately trying to fix it because uh, it looks promising because you can use all sorts of other backends. Um, so yeah, it's, as James said, it's not as good as it could be or as it should be right now, but I think that's going to be fixed in fairly short order. Yeah. As always, contributions welcome. Yes. Go ahead. What's the relation to matrix networks? Yeah, um, so we have a friendly relationship with matrix networks. Oh, yeah, the question is, what's the relationship between uh, light graphs and matrix networks? Um, so matrix networks is being developed uh, by a couple graduate students in David Perdue's group at, or David Gleick's group at Purdue. Um, <laughs> David Perdue. So uh, particularly Huda Nassar. And uh, they take a linear algebra first approach where um, people in that group are studying what can I do with graphs that I can solve with linear algebra? And so if you're looking, if that's the type of problem you're looking for, uh, or that you have, then that's a good place to, to work with. Um, now we think that based on the work we've done on abstraction, we can take any backing store or any other graph library and come and unify. Um, all we have to do is choose conventions on some function names, and then everything should be cross compatible. Um, so that's definitely a big thing. We've also, uh, to help with that, in case you've come to light graphs before and were scared off by some things, um, like it didn't meet your constraints, you needed vertex metadata, or you uh, or needed edge metadata, or you're scared off by the dependencies, we've really done a lot to reduce that, that burden, um, particularly the dependencies. We've shed a lot of the external dependencies, which was necessary for making light graphs kind of a core package that other people can build off of. Um, and so now we're, we're feeling pretty comfortable about that. Let's thank the speakers. <laughs>